This is what science is. We ask the question. I don't understand. Show me. Let's study this. This is what science does. We ask a question, we pose a hypothesis, and we start to investigate it. If everything doesn't match up with that hypothesis, we propose a different hypothesis, and we continue on. Scientists understand this. This is the way we do science. We ask a question. Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Well, thank you very much for, for the invitation to, to speak here. Uh, I was told that I, I spoke here once before. I addressed a material science group and uh, this is my 27th year of being a professor, and I don't remember being here. I, so I was told I was here. I just, you know, you travel so many different places, and, and when I came in the airport today, I'm sure it wasn't exactly the same back then as it is now, and so I just don't remember. I'm sorry, but uh, I appreciate it, and it's really a beautiful drive from the airport to here, and uh, uh, it looks like it would really be a wonderful place to live. What I'd like to do is address the topic at hand and talk about does science make faith obsolete? I'm going to give you an overview of some of my research. And uh, it, this is the only slide that I have on research, and I'll just take you through it. This is sort of like a collage to, to remind me as an outline of different things that we've done. Uh, we work on composites and, and some composites that have been used on spacecraft for curing, uh, uh, curing a, a NOAX resin, which is a resin material that is used between space shuttle tiles and uh, being able to do repair in space where we had carbon nanotubes and using just a 30 watt microwave gun, this can cause it to heat to over 1,000 degrees in 600 seconds to allow it to cure. We have another project which is actually a, a quite a new project for us where we learned that we can just write with a laser in air under ambient conditions. We can write with a laser on polyimid film, which is commercial polyimid film, and it converts the film into graphene these single atomic layer sheets of carbon. And uh, uh, we can draw patterns, and here you see an owl, but uh, we, we, we've made lots of supercapacitors out of these, which are like batteries, but they charge in just a few seconds, and they have very high power as opposed to batteries which are low power but higher energy. We've worked on a number of different procedures to split carbon nanotubes longitudinally, and so we can split them chemically so that they split, much like a water pipe will split, when it has been, uh, uh, when it, it's frozen and it will split longitudinally because the pressure is relieved in a, in a greater way by splitting longitudinally and you get graphene nanoribbons. We've applied these graphene nanoribbons onto uh, glass surfaces and so what you see here is you see a, a glass surface and uh, we're just putting a voltage across it and that, that ice will eventually melt off just by putting a voltage across it but it's not like you have lines like you have in the back window of your car. This is where, where it's, it's a, a, a transparent, thin film, and you'll see when this ice falls off, you'll see a thermocouple taped to the back side of that glass slide. But it's also RF transparent, which makes it so that you could put this in skyscrapers, because the number one building material for skyscrapers is actually, actually uh, uh, glass. And, and you want that glass to be RF transparent so you could use your cell phone in the building so that you could, you could uh, have Wi-Fi going through. And these are RF transparent films, yet conductive. Uh, we do a lot with supercapacitor devices, flexible supercapacitor devices, and this is one of my postdocs holding a supercapacitor device, which, is, which within two months after its publication was licensed to a company that builds uh, batteries and supercapacitors for electric vehicles. The thing about electric vehicles is, is you have these batteries, but we're going to be putting supercapacitors in these because most of the time you drive these cars as if they, they were just very simple vehicles, but everybody likes to accelerate quickly. And so you'll have supercapacitors there to do the acceleration, and for the other 98% of the time you just have batteries to run it. We develop material that can capture over 115% over of its weight in CO2 and we're using this for capturing CO2 out of, out of uh, oil wells. This is the leg of a roach on a piece of copper. And we heat that to 1,000 degrees and we get very nice graphene. We've shown that we can make graphene from any carbon source. 
What happens is at 1,000 degrees, any carbon source will go to its thermodynamically most stable structure on copper of graphene at 1,000 degrees. And we showed this by taking any, any carbon source, in this case, a, 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 the leg of a roach. What we've also done is we've, we've shown that we can do this with Girl Scout cookies. And one box of Girl Scout cookies, which is $4, if you take all the carbon in Girl Scout cookie, all in Girl Scout cookies and convert all of that to graphene, you could sell that graphene for $15 billion. So it shows you that the price of a material is not so much in the element cost, but in how the elements are arranged into molecular structure. We, we have other projects where we've made graphene quantum dots. Graphene quantum dots, like all quantum dots, cost about $1 million per kilogram. We've learned how to make these now from coal. Coal is $60 per ton in 25% yield in one step. That's been licensed out as well, as has this technology, this one as well, also the graphene nano ribbons. We've learned how to make graphene seamlessly go into carbon nanotubes. This makes very high surface area electrodes now. This has been uh, licensed out, and the company that's licensed this hopes to have a cell phone made out of these that will charge very rapidly, and they hope to have that cell phone on the market in about 18 months. Uh, we build sensors that go downhole that can identify oil downhole in downhole environments uh, because 30 to 70 percent of the oil is left downhole. And you say, well, why do they leave it down holes? Because we're not sure how much is down there, how much should we invest trying to get this residual oil out. And so these sensors can tell us how much is down there. We've developed a technology based on graphene oxide. We have a procedure for making graphene oxide, which has been licensed out to Merck Corporation that's scaling this up to the ton scale. This is just by taking graphite, potassium permanganate, and sulfuric acid, and you get graphene oxide. And that graphene oxide turns out to capture radioactive elements extremely well. This is the capture of uranium from water, as opposed to several other materials that are commercially used. And we're moving this technology now into Fukushima to clean up the, uh, the Fukushima site. Uh, and then it'll be used in, in mining and in oil and gas to clean up water. We have other projects where we make transparent memory. This is a transparent film. It's flexible, but it's also computer memory. That's been licensed out to a new company called Wecon and uh, uh, for the production of, of uh, uh, computer memory that's all based on two terminal devices. We have other biological uh, uh, studies where we, we, there was a tumor here that was as large as the tumor here, but that tumor is gone because the nanomaterial targeted that side, that particular tumor, and not this kind of tumor. We have other nanomaterials that can take uh, traumatic brain injured patients. These are, these are the brains of, of, of rats that have gone, undergone traumatic brain injury, and we can make it so that a rat that would normally have a brain injury like this have a brain injury more like that, just by the treatment with nanoparticles. And the way that works is by the extraction of superoxide, the conversion of superoxide to oxygen, and uh, uh, because superoxide can, is overexpressed in damaged and traumatized tissue. That also works for, for autoimmune diseases because it shuts down a superoxide activation step in T cells, which is when one's own immune system starts going after their, their bodies. And so we can slow this down. We've actually reversed rheumatoid arthritis, and it, it's showing very good results on multiple sclerosis. And one final uh, uh, segment is, is our work on nano cars. And these are small cars that are two to three nanometers in length and uh, two to three nanometers by two to th two or three nanometers. What does that mean? It means that we can part 50,000 of these cars across the diameter of a human hair. And we've built these little motors into the central segments so that when the motor turns, it could push a car across a surface. That motor spins, spins at three megahertz, which is three, three, uh, three million rotations per second. So these are the types of things. It gives you an overview of the types of things we do in our research group. This is uh, my current chemistry family. This is the research group and, uh, uh, so that, that are working in diverse areas. And everything that I presented to you, I did none of it. These are the hands. Everybody else does this. If I were to go in the lab, I think they'd, they'd worry that I'd hurt myself. And so they're the ones that, that do it all, and, and uh, uh, we, we consider ourselves a family. Well, let me tell you how I became interested in chemistry. It started out that I was going to be a New York State trooper. That's what I had, 
uh, really wanted to be, but I couldn't because I was colorblind. I don't know what the rules are now, but uh, when I was 18 and going to pursue that as a career, you couldn't uh, uh, be colorblind. I, I suspect now you could be a paraplegic and be a New York State trooper. But at the time, uh, you couldn't be colorblind. And so I thought I'd study forensic science and uh, work in a crime lab. And uh, my father gave me some advice. And, and what's really amazing that at that age, I took the advice from my father. And he said that, why don't you just get a, a general chemistry degree, and then you can specialize in forensics after that. And I took his advice. And then what happened is I took organic synthesis, and I fell in love. This was just amazing. This was strychnine. And, and I loved organic synthesis as, an, as a sophomore. Uh, you, you know, you're, you're, ex, you're assigned problems in a book, big book, last two semesters for this book, and you're assigned problems. And I would do all the problems that were assigned, and then every Friday night when other people were doing other things, I would find an empty classroom, and I would sit in that classroom on campus, and I would do all the problems in the book that had not been assigned. That's how much I loved organic chemistry and synth synthesis in particular. And because of that, I see molecular structure in everything, everything. So I know why a chair has the, has the properties it does. I know why wood has the properties that it has. I know why carpet fiber has the properties that it, that it has, so that when I walk across it, there are fibers there that if you pull out one of those fibers, you can pull that fiber up several inches, and it will, it will stay projected upward. Try that with a rubber band. It would fall right over. What is it about a fiber that can take such a small strand and have it project upward so that you can walk over it thousands and thousands of times and it just springs right back? Try to do that with cotton, and it, and, and it, it j just crushes. Try to take a, a down pillow, sit on it. You, you're just left there with this mark for where you, you sat. But, but you have a, a say you have a, a polyurethane resin, and, and uh, uh, you, you can make chairs out of these. You can make foams so that you sit down and they spring right back. Why is that? If you understand molecular structure, it all makes sense. Why does skin have the properties that it has? I see molecular structure in everything. I know that, that when I look at a tree, people see the tree, and, and, and I just look at these, these leaves, and I, and I think that what's happening is, is, is you have this metal atom sitting in the center of a porphyrin, and there's this photon of light that comes in, and it hits that metal atom, and it ejects an electron, which starts the photosynthesis pro process. When I speak to people, I look at them in the eye, and I just think of the protein synthesis that's occurring in their brain at that moment as I'm speaking to them. I see molecular structure in everything. And I'm driving this home to you because we'll see how that's come to the fore in the very issues that we'll be talking about. But for me, I see molecular structure in everything. So that when I hit a surface, you hear a sound. That sound, there's been an electrical impulse in your brain, very fast, electronically, that you, you've heard that sound, and you remember that that, that, that sound occurred when I hit, hit the podium. Now what's starting to happen in your brain is you're starting to have protein synthesis, which is starting to convert this into memory. And then as you begin to go out of here and think about this more, and particularly when you go to sleep tonight, your brain will start making new hardwired interconnect patterns so that you will remember this guy came and hit the podium, and there was a sound. You'll remember this for years and years because of the hardwired and to connect. Some of you will remember it till the day you die. And this is what I think about when I speak with people because I see molecular structure in everything. I know why paint has the properties that it does. I know why anything has the properties because I know the molecular structure that's there. But now I want to tell you some good news. I want to tell you what happened to me when I was your age. I was 18 years old. I went to college. One young man came to me, and we were in the laundry room. This was at Syracuse University. It was August of my freshman year. And I'm Jewish. I was born Jewish. I will die Jewish. I am a Jew from New York City. And he came to me, and he said, I'd like to give you an illustration of the gospel. We were just talking in the, in the laundry room, and, and, and you say, well, well, how did this conversation come up? And, I, and he was a football player in the Syracuse University football team, so I asked him if he wanted to play pro ball when he got done. He says, oh, no, I'm not good enough for that. I said, well, what do you want to do? He says, oh, probably lay ministry. And I didn't know what lay ministry was. And, uh, uh, 
And so he said something like a missionary. I said, missionary? We don't need missionaries today. We got TV. You know, this is 1977. You know, we got plenty of stuff. And, uh, and so he said he'd like to give me an, an illustration of the gospel. And he drew this little picture just like this. And he said, people are on one side of a chasm. God is on the other side. And people can't get across this because there's sin that's there. But Jesus Christ provides a way. And he had me read a number of scriptures. He had a Bible with him. He had me read a number of scriptures. And things really started to stir in my heart. And I came from a secular Jewish home in New York City, so I had not been trained against the gospel. We just never discussed Jesus in my home. And, uh, uh, and I didn't even know there was a claim on the table that Jesus Christ had died for my sins. Didn't even know it. And he had told me this, and I was really impacted. I was really impacted in particular when he had me read a verse from the Bible where Jesus said, if a man looks at a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery with her already in his heart. And at the age of 18, I was already, I was already addicted to pornography. And so when I read that verse, it really hit me because I had just said to him when he said, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, I looked at him and I said, I'm not a sinner. I'm not robbed a bank, I'm not killed anybody, how could I be a sinner? And if you know anything about modern secular Judaism, you don't dwell on sin. Uh, uh, and then, then he had me read that verse of Jesus, and it really hit me, as if Jesus knew 2,000 years ago what was going on in my heart. Well, a few months later, on the night of November 7th, 1977, I was all alone in my room. That room, room 1812, in the Lawrenson Dormitory, Lawrenson Hall Dormitory at Syracuse University. That room, all alone. My roommate wasn't there. And I'm not sure what prompted me to do this because it hadn't been demonstrated in Christianity nor in Judaism, but I got down on my knees and I asked Jesus Christ to forgive me. And I asked God to forgive me, come into my life. And something happened to me that night. And when I prayed this prayer, this peace hit me like I never knew. And I can't explain it. I have no scientific explanation for this. And I sensed somebody was in my room, and I opened to see who was there. And I couldn't see, but somebody was standing in my room. And it was this wonderful presence, and I started to weep. And you say, oh, come on, this is your imagination. Maybe, but I'm just telling you what happened to me that night. And I didn't want to get up from this presence because it was so delightful. I didn't feel I didn't feel convicted. I didn't feel as if I was being judged. I felt forgiven. And I felt freed. And what's this Jewish kid from New York City going to do? I didn't tell anybody. I didn't know what to do. For two weeks, I didn't tell anybody. And then the young man who had shared with me, he also lived on the floor. He said to me, he says, Jim, have you invited Jesus in your heart? I said, I, I think I have. Why do you ask? He says, you haven't stopped smiling for weeks. Something happened to me that day. I was like many young people. I was angry in many ways, and I had I'd never tried to commit suicide, but I thought a lot about it. And uh, that day, something happened, and I changed. Then there were these four men, Dr. Koshi Bak Singh, Professor Brosma, and Professor Buck Hatch, all at different places. Dr. Koshi and, and, and Brother Bak Singh from India, uh, um, they taught me a lot about Christianity. Dr. Brosma was from uh, uh, Purdue University when I was doing my PhD, and Buck Hatch when I was at uh, the University of South Carolina. Men poured into my lives. Of these four men, there's only three of them that are left here on earth. And, uh, uh, but I've devoted my life to pouring into other people's lives as these men have poured into my life. That's my family, and uh, I have two sons. Ben is a sophomore at Rice. And uh, the reason he's at Rice is because professors' children get free tuition, <laughs> and that is a great deal. Uh, Josiah is in medical school. Sabrina just finished Vanderbilt Law School, and Abreen lives in Jerusalem with her husband and our two grandchildren. And uh, uh, this is my wife of 33 years. And uh, let me just mention, I've been married 33 years. I got married my second year of graduate school. And... Uh, uh, my oldest daughter was born a couple years after that. Umbreen was born a couple years after that. And uh, we were like many young couples. We had our struggles. But I encourage you, if you're going through struggles in your marriage, hang on. 
We've been married 33 years, and it is so good to be married to this woman for this long. So wonderful. I have on my website, jmtour.com, if you go into the personal topics section, I have an audio message, a series, a six-part series. Each part's about 30 minutes uh, on scriptural sexual ethics. If you're having trouble in your marriage, this is particularly for young marrieds, or if you're going to be moving into marriage, listen to this series. I understand that young people are non-linear learners, but this, do it linearly. That means you listen to part one. After you're done, you listen to part two, right through part six. And then it will really change your marriage. It really will. Okay, does science make faith obsolete? Science has never shaken my faith. Uh, Lord Kelvin, we have, name our temperature scale out of him, uh, uh, from him. He developed two of the three laws of thermodynamics. He said, I have long felt that there was a general impression that the scientific world believes science has discovered ways of explaining all the facts of nature without adopting any definite belief in a creator. I have never doubted that impression was utterly groundless. Science actually strengthens my faith. Here's what Lord Kelvin said. The more thoroughly I conduct scientific research, the more I believe science excludes atheism. If you think strongly enough, you will be forced by science to, to believe in God, which is the foundation of all religion. It's interesting. You know, there's a tremendous excitement that a scientist with faith can have, and hopefully I'll leave you with some of that. But here's Ronald Ross. Ronald Ross discovered that, that malaria... The malaria parasite lives in the mosquito's stomach. Before that, they thought it was just these fumes, that, the, the, this, the, this sulfur aroma that comes from swamps. And Ronald Ross was a, was a uh, physician, and he was working in India. And you can read his work about how just sweat would pour out of him. He couldn't pay people to fan him because it would blow apart the mosquito parts that he was working on. He had one remaining eyepiece for his microscope that was cracked but it was the only remaining eyepiece that worked. The knobs on his microscope were frozen from the sweat that would drip if they had rusted frozen. And this man worked under tremendously harsh conditions. He himself contracted malaria while he was doing this. But the night he discovered that, it was, that he could see this growing in the, in the belly of the mosquito, he wrote a poem to his wife, which gives us a clue as to the excitement. This day relenting God has placed within my hand a wondrous thing, and God be praised at his command. Seeking his secret deeds with tears and toiling breath, I find thy cunning seeds, O million murdering death. I know this little thing a myriad men will save. O death, where is your sting? Thy victory, O grave. Obviously, this was a man who read the Bible, because if you read the Bible, you see he's extracted a lot of portions from that. But you see an excitement here. Let me share with you just one instance of excitement that's come in my life. On September 3rd, 1993, I was invited to Purdue University to give a talk. I had gotten my PhD at Purdue, and, and uh, I started as a professor in 1988 at the University of South Carolina. And, and uh, within three years, I had gotten tenure, and uh, uh, by this time, I was, I was uh, just, just getting to the point where I was being converted from associate to prof professor to full professor. I was staying right there in the Purdue Memorial Union, which is uh, like a hotel on campus, really a beautiful place that's beautifully remodeled. And I was staying in that hotel. And as I do, before I give any talk, I will pray. Even to give a lecture on campus, chemistry lecture, nanotechnology lecture. I was in my office praying that God would impact the hearers. And I pray before I give lessons in a church. I teach a, a weekly Bible study to about 150 college students. And uh, I always pray that the Holy Spirit would just pour out and hit them. Now, you do that in a church, people expect that. You do that in a scientific lecture, they don't know what hit them. And that morning I was praying because I was intimidated because my professor, my mentor was going to be there. H. Nagishi was a Japanese man and uh, 
He ended up 30 years later getting the Nobel Prize, or, or not 30 years after 1993, 30 years from the time I had worked with him. In 2010, he got the Nobel Prize. And I was reading this verse, and uh, uh, here's, here's Professor Nagishi, who won the 2010 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And, and uh, God really started to raise my faith. And I read the Bible from beginning to end. I start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. I read through picking up where I left off the day before. Every day I read the Bible. And I've been doing this for more than 35 years. And when I get done with Revelation chapter 22, I start again. I just keep going through it. And that day I was reading from Matthew. And it says, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And I said, Lord, you're really raising my faith through this. I pray, Lord, that the seminar today in the chemistry department will be the best seminar ever in that department. And I said, Lord, how am I going to know? The department's 100 years old. How am I going to know that it was the best seminar? Well, I pray that my professor, the one under whom I trained and got my PhD, Professor Nagishi, would say that it is a super seminar. And that was a big thing because... When I was a graduate student with him, no matter what I did in his laboratory, no matter how good it was, I'd bring him the result, he would say, pretty good, for your level. And I never got past this man's waist. I said, I, none of this for your level stuff. I pray that he said that, it, that was a super seminar. Well, when I got done with that seminar, I knew God had really blessed. And when I got done, Professor Nagishi was sitting right on the first row, right on the end. He stood up and he said, Supa! Supa! <laughs> the Lord answered my prayer directly. Sitting right behind him was this man, H.C. Brown, who had already had the Nobel Prize, 1979 Nobel Prize for the hydroboration reaction. And I went down and I, I thanked Professor Nagishi, and then I, Professor Brown was still sitting. He was in his 80s at the time, and he held on to my hand as I shook his hand. He said, I want you to know something. I said, what's that, sir? He said, that was the best seminar I've ever seen in my life. And I said, that's very kind of you to say that. And in typical Nobel laureate fashion, he said, I'm not saying it to be kind. I really mean it. <laughs> this is a taste of what God does, a scientist with faith. God gives inspiration in my work. He doesn't tell me what temperature to run the reactions at but he gives inspiration, and I pray for inspiration. You saw how many people are in my research group? I have all of their names on my smartphone. And every day I go to the chapel at noontime, I get on my knees, and I pray for every one of them name by name that they would come to know the joy that I have in Jesus and that God would bless their work. How does a cell operate? This is a cell, all right? It's got all of this function. It is amazing. A cell is a factory. If you flew over New York City at 30,000 feet, you would say, oh, there is a city. See those little things moving down there? That's a city. But you would not get the detail of a city at 30,000 feet. But if you go into that city, you'd go, my goodness, look at all this stuff going on here. And then you go underground and you see the conduits and the, and, and, and the piping and the steam fittings and all the stuff and the subway systems and the wiring and all the infrastructure that runs this thing. Amazing. You go into a cell and it is not a blob of protoplasm. It is highly sophisticated. How do you get material from here to here? How do you move stuff around like in a factory? A factory, you see these, these tracks where, where things move. That's exactly what happens. These are these tubules that, that build very rapidly. Enzymes come, build them. You need material from point A to point B, it builds a, 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 a track. And then the material moves across and then it destroys the track so it can use those pieces to build a track somewhere else. Constantly going on in a cell. A lot of it we understand, a lot of it we don't. Though I don't understand the vast chemical mechanisms in a cell, it clearly does operate. I don't understand it, but it does operate. So it doesn't take Jim Tour to understand it to work. But it's not improper to ask the question, by what chemical mechanisms does it function? The very question spawns further investigation. This is what science is. We ask the question. I don't understand. Show me. Let's study this. This is what science does. 
We ask a question, we pose a hypothesis, and we start to investigate it. If everything doesn't match up with that hypothesis, we propose a different hypothesis, and we continue on. Scientists understand this. This is the way we do science. We ask a question. The question most often asked of me by students is, what do you think about evolution? Well, all of my colleagues are Darwinists, and I love them as people, and I deeply respect them as scientists. And I hope that they feel the same about me. And here, for this talk, a Darwinist holds that random mutation and natural selection account for the complexity of life. That's what will define it for this talk, because different people have different ideas. So for this talk, we'll say a Darwinist holds that random mutation and natural selection account for the complexity of life. The thing that often most impacts my Darwinist friends is this. When they are confronted with a devout Christian Darwinian skeptic who is also an equally accomplished scientist, they scratch their head. How could this be? I don't want to be an attacking critic. I just want to learn from them. My question to the Darwinist is this. I just ask them to explain evolution to me from a chemical perspective, not the origin of life. That's much harder. But just evolution. You understand it? Explain it to me. Let's sit down. Explain it to me. This is from my website. If you went to jmtour.com, you'd see this. Some are disconcerted or even angered that I signed a statement back in 2001, 2001 along with 700 other scientists which says, we are skeptical of the claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. That's it. That's the statement I signed. Now, that came to me in an email. You know how you're plowing through emails? You say, could you agree to this? Yes, boom. Little did I know, you know, that put my name on some infamous list. But as I look back at it, I don't regret that. All I say is, I'm skeptical. So, we, so further examination is encouraged. Isn't further examination in how a cell works encouraged? Or do you say, no, we understand it, boom, case closed, don't touch that. No, we say, go ahead, explain it. Because there's so much about a cell's chemical mechanisms we don't understand. This has become the moral touchstone within so much of science. Because you signed this statement, you'll not be brought into this society, this has been told to me. Because of this statement. Regardless of everything that I've done, you'll not be in because you signed this. Because I say we should investigate it more? Why do people believe that? Is this the one area that you can't go near? You know what this sounds like to me? It sounds like a religion. People don't like to ask, like you asking too much about your religion because you don't have all these answers about it. But about science, we never shun people from asking questions, except on this. So I go on on my website. I simply do not understand chemically how macroevolution could have happened. Hence, am I not free to join the ranks of the skeptical and to sign such a statement without reprisals from those that disagree with me? Furthermore, when I, a nonconformist, ask proponents for clarification, they get flustered in public and they and confessional in, pri in private, wherein they sheepishly confess that they really don't understand either. Let me tell you what happens in the back room of science. I have had Nobel Prize winners, National Academy members in my office, and I look them in the eye and I say, do you understand evolution of a complex system? Do you understand macroevolution from a chemical perspective? Every chemist has said to me, no. Every one of them. I had one uh, uh, Israeli biophysicist at the Weissman Institute. I was sitting in his office, and I asked him, he was describing to me that the, the modulus in the a rod in the ear that, that shakes back and forth in and, and this rod. It's amazing that the modulus, meaning the stiffness of the rod as you go down the rod, changes. And this is what gives us this, this real, really tremendous ability to hear, hear at all these different frequencies. I said, how does something like that evolve? And you know what he said to me? Typical Jewish reply. Oh, Jim, we all believe in evolution, but we have no idea how it happened. That's what happens in the back room of science. But you ask them publicly, oh, of course I believe in evolution. Oh. All right, explain it to me. None of them will explain it to me. 
Well, that's all I'm saying. I don't understand it. But I'm asking it publicly as opposed to privately. Remember, I'm not trying to find, I'm just asking the question. Does anyone understand the chemical details behind macroevolution? If so, I would like to sit with that person and be taught. So I invite them to meet with me. Lunch will be my treat. Until then, I will maintain that no chemist understands. Hence, we are collectively bewildered. And I have not even addressed the origin of first life issues. For me, that is even more scientifically mysterious than evolution. I don't understand it. I put this challenge years ago, I don't know, eight years ago, 10 years ago on my website. Even the Atheist Society of America said, somebody go to Houston and share with this guy. Nobody's come. The Atheist Society said they'd even pay for the lunch. Nobody will come. You know how many chemical engineers and chemists live in the city of Houston because it's, a, it's the mecca for, for the chemical industry in the United States? Nobody comes. We have a whole Department of Evolutionary Biology at Rice. Nobody comes. You think they just put their arm around my shoulder? Jim, let me, let's go to the faculty club. I'll take care of it. I understand this. Let me show you. Nobody. What's going on here? One graduate student from Berkeley said that he would come if he had a ticket, and so somebody said, I'll buy you the ticket. But then he said, well, I'm not going to go because Tour doesn't want it recorded. The reason I didn't want it recorded is because I didn't want one up in the chip. I said, I'll buy you lunch. Just explain it to me. And then the guy said he would send me some articles on evolution of a complex system from a molecular perspective, and I'm still waiting. That's over one year ago. He was supposed to send me those. They don't exist. Darwin never addressed origin of life, and I can see why he did not. He was far too smart for that. Present-day scientists that expose their thoughts on this become ever so timid when they talk with me privately. I simply cannot understand the source of their confidence when addressing their positions publicly. If anybody should understand evolution, it is me. If anybody could be able to understand it, it is me. I see molecular structure in everything. There's nothing that you can show me that I won't tell you, give you a general idea of what the molecular structure is. How come I can't understand it? You fly over at 30,000 feet in biology, everything looks simple. You get down in the details, you're like, huh? How does this happen? What's the outcome of my skepticism of Darwinian evolution? Was it denied tenure? No. 27 years ago when I started, it was not that much of an issue. Nobody even worried about it. And I got tenure very quickly. Loss of funding, not that I can positively identify. I don't know, I just figured if I, one of my grants is not funded, I wrote a bad proposal. I mean, I'm known for that. Harassment, not to any significant degree. Ridicule on rare occasions, but often, often not directly at me, not directly to me. They'll say something maybe behind my back that I'll hear about. But confrontations, yes. But these are often diffused with a few questions. I don't argue this. I just say, OK, explain it to me. But they know they can't just say, well, the molecule does this, the molecule does it. Show me. What molecule does what? Show me the reaction. Have I not been hired for a position? I suspect so. Have I been excluded from professional societies? Yes, because they've told me so. But I reflect on the words of Charles Spurgeon, who said, those who criticize us are probably no more mistaken than those who praise us. Try to win your critic with double kindness. I don't want to have enemies. I really don't. So I try to be friends with everyone. Here's the hope that I see. Science is self-correcting. If Darwinian theory is correct, the chemical description will become evident. I can't say Darwinian theory is incorrect. I can't say that. All I say is I don't understand the chemistry behind it. And I have never met a chemist who does, who's willing to explain it to me. As of today, in my opinion, there is little such evidence, so further investigation is warranted. I suppose greater than 99% of scientists never think about confronting anyone on these issues. They're, they're too busy with other things. Most scientists don't bother with this. They're thinking about other things. Now, if you ask them, do you believe in Oh, yeah, I believe in this. But if you start probing, okay, t tell me what it is you believe. Oh, yeah, yeah you know. We, 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 we see... Um, Microevolution happens all the time in test tubes in the lab. We do. But macroevolution is different. If you try to lump those together, remember, it was not the, the nonconformists that separated those two. That was separated in the literature long before the nonconformists came along. I mean evolution of a complex system. You don't even have to tell me, you don't even have to tell me a human being. I mean, that's too come. Just a very simple system. Show me. Show me the chemistry. Show me the chemistry. 
The younger generation has a deeper sense of social fairness and justice, and they're less impressed with conformal academic fluff. I have great faith in the younger generation. I really do. These older folks, they're going to just dig in their heels. But the younger generation says, this is unfair, what you're doing to these people. They have a great sense of social justice, much more than in my generation. Uh, young people that come out of school today, many, many of them want to just take a couple years, work for a nonprofit, work for some non-government organization, or do some sort of service for a couple of years. When I was in school, you just grabbed your degree and ran, you know, ran like a thief to get to graduate school or get to a job. I mean, and now, now uh, people think very differently. This is Rick Smalley, won the 1996 Nobel Prize. He's the one who recruited me to Rice 16 years ago. He won it for uh, uh, the Nobel Prize for the discovery of C60, along with Bob Curl at Rice and Harold Croto, who was uh, 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 doing research at Rice at the time. And Rick came to the Lord a couple years before he died. We were on an airplane together, going to see the CEO of Intel at one time, and we sat next to each other. We were sitting next to each other, and he looked over at me and says, Jim, do you believe all that stuff in the Bible? I said, yeah. He said, finally somebody with a brain that I can speak to. And we spoke for a couple hours on that flight. When we got done talking, he said, you know, you know why you spoke with me? I said, no, why is that? He said, you spoke to me because you're really a Jew. If you'd have been a Baptist, you'd have just said, well, that's the way it is. <laughs> the primary mission to which I am called is to reflect the love of Jesus. Let me share with you something that Max Planck said. We have Planck's constant. He says, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die. That's what will happen. They'll eventually die off and the younger generation will come forward and say, I don't understand this either. The emperor has no clothes. Let's try to figure this thing out. We can't say that Darwinian evolution is wrong. Just ask the question. Just ask the question. Scientists don't repent. Scientists will rarely admit that they were wrong. Uh, they just die. Does science make faith obsolete? Not for me. Not for me. Let me leave you with this. If any of you were at all impressed by what I said about how I came to faith, and the way Jesus Christ visited me on November 7th, 1977. You come and talk to me afterward, and I will share with you more, and you will never be the same. You can have the same experience, and you will never be the same. Before Nick comes up, I want full disclosure. I shared a copy of my slides with Nick before this talk, and he with me. Thank you very much. So in case you uh, forgot, when, when Bob did the original introduction, uh, my name is Nick Fitzke. I am traveled a lot less uh, distance to get here than Jim did, a uh, much less harrowing journey. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of chemistry in the, uh, well, in the chemistry department here at Mississippi State. Uh, I've been here for about three and a half years. And so one of the contrasts you're going to see uh, between Jim's story and my story is uh, you have Jim who's been very, very successful, very, very accomplished as a chemist. Uh, relatively speaking, I'm just getting started. And so um, you know, I'm, I'm going to start my talk in a, in a similar way, uh, but hopefully you'll see some, some uh, similarities. Hopefully you'll see some, some contrasts uh, in what we have to say. Uh, but just to begin, uh, whereas Jim had a, had a very beautiful slide with, with probably 50 different pictures of things that he's worked on over the, over the past 27 years, uh, I don't have, have quite so much to talk about. But, but what I do have to talk about is exceedingly inter interesting to me. Uh, and so one of the questions that, that I'm interested in as sort of a biological, physical chemist is the question of protein folding. And so that sounds very boring and very obscure, I'm sure, to many of you. But really, it's just a question of molecular structure. So it's, it's very well related to uh, what Jim was talking about, being able to see structure everywhere. 
And so here, here's the conundrum. If we start and we have this um, you know, carbon chain, uh, it could be any number of polymers, and I put that carbon chain into a solution, uh, what I'm going to see in general is that that carbon chain is going to look like a piece of spaghetti. It's not going to have any regular structure. It's not going to be um, you know, rigid in any way. It's going to be fairly dynamic. And you know, this is representative, but there's literally thousands of different structures that you could possibly have for this piece of spaghetti. On the other hand, if I take a protein, so, so for me, proteins are the molecules of life. I, I appreciate what my nucleic acid colleagues are doing in biophysics, but, but proteins are where it's at, in my opinion. And so the, the backbone of a protein looks like this, repeated over and over again. And if I take a protein and put it in a solution, instead of getting something that looks like a random piece of spaghetti, I get something that looks nice and, and beautiful. It has these nice helical, these, these long strand type structures. Uh, it's compact, it's rigid, it's generally not very dynamic. And these structures are essentially the scaffolding upon which all of the chemistry of life is built. Okay, and so this is a very simple protein, but you can have very complex proteins that, that are set up to do exquisite chemistry, uh, which can do everything from receive light in your eye to digest food to, to cause al Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Um, and so the question is, how does a protein go from you know, sort of a random disordered state into something that's this beautiful structure and capable of doing chemistry? And obviously that's where uh, my interest as a physicist come in because this question has all sorts of, of implications in terms of molecular forces and what's the relevant chemistry here. And so, so being a biophysical chemist, you know, Jim talked about the excitement of being a chemist. Um, it's something I really love to do every day and it's a privilege to be able to investigate these types of questions. And so more recently, uh, our work is sort of focused on, on maybe even a little bit of a related field to what Jim's been doing, where you know, now we're looking at this, this beautiful structure. So this is the same protein that I had on the previous slide. And now this big yellow sphere, this is a gold nanoparticle. And it's the same kind of question. If I take this, uh, a solution of this protein and put it in and mix it up together with gold nanoparticles, it's been known for a long, long time that that protein is going to spontaneously coat the surface of the nanoparticle. But the question is, what happens to it once it gets there? Does it revert to its spaghetti state? Or does it stay nice and folded and globular? And if it stays like this, maybe there's a way to engineer or design a protein that can, can stay stable on the surface and have all of the nice properties that we like, of pro that we like proteins to have. And then we could use those for some of the very applications that Jim was talking about drug delivery, uh, therapeutics, and, and uh, diagnostics. And so we're trying to elucidate these kind of design principles in the lab. And so we have to understand about proteins. We have to understand uh, protein structure and molecular forces. And similar to, to Jim, um, you know, I have a much smaller group. But uh, these are the people who get the work done on a day-to-day -day basis. These are the people who think, think really hard about these problems. Uh, and so I have a small group, and then in the back here, that's our uh, NMR instrument, that's the workhorse uh, where we do a lot of our experiments. Um, I have my email address here. I don't have a, a, a really fancy website, but, but I do have a website, and so if you're interested in looking up what we do or, or finding more about us, uh, you, can, you can contact us or check out the web page. Okay, so the real question you're probably asking is, you know, what's this guy from Mississippi State doing up on the stage when we just had this really, really, really um, accomplished scientist give a, a, a really interesting and compelling talk uh, about science and, and faith and, and does one make the other obsolete? Well, probably as most of you are thinking, you know, when you think about a scientist, if I say, you know, tell me about a scientist, the, the first thing that, well, maybe not the first thing, um, but one of the first things that will probably co or come into your mind is that most scientists are, are what you might call secular. And Jim had a point about this too, where, you know, it just questions about how I got here, you know, what's the origin of morals, you know, what's the meaning of life, you know, that's not really relevant to what a lot of scientists think about. Uh, if you're trying to predict the weather better, you're probably not spending a lot of time in your office sitting there thinking about, oh, what's the meaning of life today? 
Uh, and, and similarly, if you're trying to develop a new compound to catalyze some chemical reaction, it's probably unlikely that you're sitting there thinking about those types of questions. And so for most scientists, and really for a lot of people who wouldn't be Christians, most of these questions simply aren't relevant to their day-to-day -day life. But nevertheless, you have some exceptions, and so Richard Dawkins would be one of them. We had Harold Krotos come here speak a few years ago, uh, where they would probably be in the camp of outspoken atheists. And so outspoken atheists, as I thought about it, what, what do you need to get in front of a public forum and, and talk about atheism or ag agnosticism? Well, in my mind, you needed three things. You need strong convictions. So you need to believe that you're right. You need to have thought about it for, for a good bit so that you can articulate those ideas in a public forum. And then you just have to have a desire to speak publicly. You know, if, if you, you could be a very committed agnostic, but if you don't want to go in front of a, a large audience and speak about that, you know, you might not be so interested in doing it. Uh, and in this particular case, if we wanted to have somebody who was an agnostic speak in this forum, you know, they'd have to be willing to get up and, and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with, with Jim Tor. And knowing what you know now about how accomplished he is, you, you're pretty sure he's going to bring his A game. And he did. Um, and so, so we actually did uh, a fair uh, a approximation, or at least a fair, fair effort in my estimation, uh, to an effort to try to find a, a non-Christian or, or certainly a skeptical uh, scientist to get up here and, and speak before you tonight. And so again, full disclosure, I'm neither a secular person or an outspoken atheist. Um, you know, Dr. Tor and I share a common faith, um, although we will differ, and, and I'll explain to you some of the differences that we have. But, um, you know, I think, you know, just to be fair, I think we did try and, and do our due diligence to find a secular voice here tonight. And so, you know, the next question, well, why am I here? Because, again, I don't want to get up here and parrot everything that, that Jim had just said. Um, one is, you know, obviously, as somebody who's only been here for three and a half years and been a, been a professor for less than four, um, you know, Jim is arguably a, a top ten chemist. Uh, he's an exceptional track record of publications. You, you heard what he, he was talking about with his thousands of citations. If you multiply my publications by a hundred, you might get close to something that, that he's done. Um, and so, in that sense, maybe I'm going to provide a little bit of a different perspective uh, than, than somebody who's been super accomplished at that level. Uh, and, and I think that's probably true. Um, even though we're different, we share a common faith. And so that's, that's one of the themes that I think is important here tonight, is that you don't need to be super accomplished uh, to be able to defend your ideas and, and to uh, you know, speak out and, and have convictions. Uh, one difference that might, might be evident is that I'm, I'm more comfortable being called a theistic evolutionist. Does that mean I understand everything? Absolutely not. And I'll talk about that uh, in a second. But even though I would call myself a Christian, I think I would be at least passingly comfortable with, with what evolutionary theory predicts. And, and finally, I think, you know, when I was thinking about what I should say when I'm up in front of everybody, I thought, well, maybe I can be a little bit of a devil's advocate. Now, I know there's probably skeptics in the audience, and if I really tried to be a devil's advocate, I'm sure you'd see right through it. Uh, and so hopefully some of that can come out in the Q&A, and that's one of the reasons I think it's important to have Q&A at a forum like this, uh, particularly when both of the speakers are, are Christians. Um, but I'll, I'll do my best and bring up a couple of points that, that I think might be important to point out. Okay, so, so now let, let's get to the question at hand. Um, you know, you can think about, does science make faith obsolete? And as I was thinking about that topic, what I was thinking was, well, maybe that means that there's a conflict between what science says and what's, what uh, faith would have me believe. And as I was thinking about that, I thought, well, and again, full disclosure, I am a Christian, so, so one of the first things that I wanted to do was look into Scripture and see what Scripture said. And I, I had my attention drawn to uh, Psalm 19. And so Psalm 19, verses 1 and 2, uh, says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. And so I think, you know, this verse, or these two verses, I think put into context some of the, the discoveries that Jim was talking about during his talk 
as far as, you know, discovering the malaria parasite, right? These verses invite us to investigate the natural world and, and to find in it uh, reasons to glorify and to worship God. And so, you know, this particular psalm seems to say, hey, look at the natural world, look at the skies, look at the earth, and, and look to see what you can see as far as learning about um, how God created the world and how the world works. And don't use this as something to say, well, I don't believe in God. Use it to say, wow, God's really cool because he did things in, in natural and, and specific and, and you know, nearly mechanistic ways in some cases. Okay, and so, so Psalm, 1 and, or Psalm 19, 1 and 2 sort of invites us to look at the natural world, whereas Psalm 19, 7, you go you know, five verses down, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is true, making wise the simple. And so, you know, here we have five verses later, and now we're not talking about the natural world anymore. We're talking about, you know, God's Word and the Bible and, and you know, His revealed Scripture. Uh, and so, you know, looking at the fact that these two are so close together, it would seem to indicate, or at least to me it says, that the Bible doesn't think that there should be a conflict between you know, what your religion, what, what Christianity would have you believe, and what we would find via science. Okay, and, and there's other examples of this too. Um, Bezalel in the Old Testament, who was you know, uh, en enlisted to craft the tabernacle, you know, he was clearly a metallurgist. He knew how to cast metals and make molds of things. Um, and you know, further, if you go on further in the scripture, you don't really ever see a situation where it says, oh, well, in the afterlife or in heaven, we're going to have, you know, perfect knowledge of creation. And so for me, you know, you asked me, is there a conflict between religion and, and science? I say no. I think there's probably going to be scientists in heaven uh, because, you know, there's no indication that we're ever going to fully exhaust the knowledge of the real world. You know, there's probably not going to be, uh, you know, medical doctors in heaven because there might not be disease. But certainly scientists, I think that there's going to be science in heaven. And so I don't see a conflict here, and I think Scripture is telling us that in the final analysis, there's not going to be a conflict. Uh, we might see conflicts here and there, uh, here, and here on earth, but in the final analysis, when we look back, I don't think we're going to see a conflict. And so, but, but the skeptic is going to say, well, that's great, but I don't really believe in Scripture, so Psalm 19 has no, no bearing on me. Uh, and to which I would say that's fair enough. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think it's important to look at these issues that, that you know, consistently come up. And so, so Jim, when, when he talked in his talk, talked about evolution, I think it would be fair uh, for me to talk, talk about that too because I have a slightly different view. Now, that's not to say I, I think Jim is a bad Christian or, or that, you know, people who disagree with me are somehow, you know, wrong, probably it's more likely that most Christians disagree with me, and that's, that's fine. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do share a slightly different view, uh, even if I don't perfectly understand everything. And so, you know, obviously we would say that evolution describes the diversity of organisms that we see. And I think, you know, if we want to establish our terms, um, it's oftentimes good to say this is what the definition is. And so for me, this is what, what evolution means. And as I've thought about it, now I will say I'm not an evolutionary biologist, uh, but I have thought a lot about proteins, protein structure, and I've even taught some bioinformatics. So I, I feel like I have a, a fair understanding of, of what's going on with, you know, protein molecules. But in that estimation, evolution sort of needs three things. It needs a molecular mechanism for change, okay? And so for me, that means... Uh, now, it's not dramatic, but it means changes in the DNA sequence, so slow mutations occurring uh, over time. And so, you know, I, we look at, we, we see that happening on, on the microevolutionary scale, and so we certainly have a molecular mechanism for change out there. It might happen very slowly, but, but there's something there that can change the DNA sequence and thus the protein sequence uh, over time. Okay? There needs to be a method of selecting good changes. Now, on the, on the macro scale, this might be something like a beak. You know, a shorter, uh, fatter beak might be better than a longer, thinner beak. Um, on a microscopic scale, it might be, you know, an enzyme with a particular mutation 
might be somewhat more efficient at a particular catalytic reaction than, a, than another enzyme without that mutation. But either way, we, we assume, and, and maybe this assumption isn't always true, but by and large, uh, I, I'm comfortable with this, is that you know, natural selection, or at least the ability for certain mutations to give a certain advantage to uh, some, some type of organization or organism, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable that, that that can happen sometimes. And then, and then here's the main thing that I think you know, a lot of us, uh, you know, we might differ on, or, you know, and to be honest, I don't fully understand this now, but, but you need lots of time. Okay, and so uh, we have a mechanism for slow change, we have a method for selecting good, good changes, but ultimately you just need a lot of time. And, and I'm not always 100% comfortable saying that the time that we have is enough, but I guess I'm at that point where I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, even, if I, even if I can't fully explain, well, why, why does it take so long, or why does it seem to take so long? Um, and anyway, and if you have those three things, then evolutionary theory would predict that present-day present species should show some kind of genetic relationship. Okay, and so in my estimation, again, I don't fully understand everything, we have these three requirements, we have this prediction, which we generally see is true, and, and because of that, I'm okay with evolution. I might not fully understand everything, but, but I'm at least comfortable enough that I'm willing to say, yeah, this is possible. Now, what's this graph over here? Because I didn't, haven't talked at all about it. It's basically just a way of, of demonstrating or showing in a picture the slow evolutionary change over time. Okay, and so this is, this is com combined from archeological evidence where we've, where we've dated things um, archeologically, and then also looking at the actual protein sequence as it changes over time. And what you see for three different proteins, we have fibrinopeptides, we have uh, hemoglobin, and we have cytochrome C, and you can see that there's a certain constant rate of change per unit time. Okay, so for the fibrinopeptides, they seem to be changing really quickly. Hemoglobin is somewhere in the middle, and cytochrome, which is a very key uh, enzyme in, in human life, well, all life, you see is changing relatively slowly. Okay, and so this is just sort of bringing in the point that we do see changes in protein structure over time, and, you know, if we can select for the good changes, again, add enough of those changes together. Maybe it takes a million years. Maybe it's longer than the age of the universe. I think that's where the, the uncertainty lies. But if you give it lots of time, you will see change. Okay, and so that's sort of my understanding. That's the, the non-evolutionary biologist's understanding of evolution. Uh, but, you know, what, what do I take away from that as a, as a Christian? Well, given that God is sovereign over everything, and, and I do believe that, you know, if I look at things like evolutionary rates and these observations that, that proteins seem to be related across different species, I'm not terribly threatened by evolutionary theory. I can look at it, I can, I can say, well, I might not understand how it all works, but you know, if I look at it enough, I can say, well, yeah, I, I can see why you might think that that's true. Uh, certainly, it's a useful model uh, to describe how organisms are related, and so when I talk to my agnostic or my atheist friends, I don't, I don't give them any flack really whatsoever because coming at this from a non-theistic point of view, this is the best you got, okay? It might be hard to understand how all these time scales add up, but if you're not going to believe in God and you're going to think of things as random chance, you know, maybe I give them too much credit, but, but generally I say, okay, if you're, if you're going to hold evolutionary theory, you know, I'm, 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 I'm going to say it's probably sovereign, or that God's sovereign over it, uh, but I can, I can understand why you would believe it as somebody who doesn't believe in God. So, but that's the first point. I'm not really threatened by evolutionary theory. But the second point, and this, this might raise some eyebrows, is that, you know, we've shown that there's a me mechanism for change and slow mutation, and we've shown that, you know, practically speaking, you see uh, microevolutionary instances where natural selection applies. And so if you just extrapolate, I mean, that's a huge extrapolation, and you might not be comfortable with it, and to be honest, at times I'm not super comfortable with it either. But 
from that point of view, we shouldn't be surprised if sometime in the next 20 years, some scientist comes up with an example of speciation. Because God created organisms with, with genetic material, and that genetic material can be modified. And if, since we know that all, we all share the same genetic material, it shouldn't surprise us if somebody can take uh, a genetic you know, organism from, from one period of time and you know, either accelerate evolution or do something that we would see uh, some new species appear in the next 20 years. And so even if, you're, even if you're a young Earth creationist, you sort of have to recognize that because microevolution micro -evolution happens, if you waited around for all of eternity, you would probably see something happening that would look a little bit like macroevolution. Now again, it might take you for all eternity, and, and, and I think the real difference here is that the real hardcore evolutionary people would say, no, that would be a couple million years, whereas the people who are, who are skeptical about evolution, they might say, oh, no, we're talking like more than the age of the universe, so 15, 16 billion years old. But it seems like God has the world that, with the potential to evolve. And then, you know, but this is all with the caveat that theologically I don't understand everything either. And so there's the science that I don't understand, uh, and certainly I, I don't put myself as somebody who has everything um, explained, but theologically, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't been to seminary, and I don't necessarily know everything on the theological side either. Uh, and so some of what I've been using has, has come from or been inspired by uh, the folks at an organization called BioLogos, but, you know, I, I just want to put in the caveat here that I'm not there yet either, and there's certainly more things that I don't know than I do know. Okay, the other conflict that, that lots of people bring up, and I think is, is worth mentioning, and, and Jim said a little bit, maybe, maybe I'm foolish to try to explain it at all, but I don't really understand the origins of life either. I don't think anybody does. I think that's probably the one thing that, that is absolutely true that we can all agree on here, is that nobody really knows what's going on. At the same time, I'm not threatened by this either. If you want to investigate RNA world and, and you know, simple RNA molecules that can make proteins, I think that would be really, really cool. You know, I don't think the Bible is giving us a molecular detail of how things, you know, how God created life. Uh, and so certainly the Bible mentions nowhere in it protein or RNA. And so, well, I guess there's some, some you know, meat sacrifices, but, but not, not in the protein sense that I'm talking about. So, you know, if you want to study RNA and you want to look and, and you want to hypothesize, you know, that's, that's really interesting to me. And I say that's, that's good science. Go figure it out. Let's see what, let's see what we com come up with. The problem here is that, you know, the molecular mechanism for this isn't at all clear. Okay, we can sort of look at DNA mutations over time and say, yeah, that, that might be enough to give us the change that we need for evolution. But the mechanism for, for you know, abiogenesis or the origin of life is, is nowhere near understood. Okay, and, and that's just, or it has to be very, very different, right? So if we look here at our fastest protein evolution, you know, we see about a change of 1% in the sequence per every million years. Now let's put some time scales to that. The Earth is about four and a half year, billion years old. Uh, the first fossils or life is thought to have taken hold around three and a half billion years ago. So that gives us about you know, a billion years plus or minus for the Earth to cool and for all the things to happen that could give us life. Okay, now that's, you know, that's a thousand million years and what we're showing here is that the fastest peptide or the fastest protein evolution that we have on record or one of the fastest, certainly, is about 1% every 1 million years. And so, to me, that seems like those two timescales are, are very, very different. And so whatever had to go into the origin of life, it couldn't be explained by this kind of thing. And so I think that's, that's all the more reason to study it and to look, look in and see what we can find. Okay, so the last two slides. Again, I don't want to take up too much time because I think Jim did such a good job. Um, but obviously, Jim and I are both very scientifically minded. He's an extremely accomplished scientist, um, and he, he certainly has a lot uh, of good things to say about these kinds of things, and he's thought about it a lot, okay? Someday, I'm open to get there myself, but, but for now, we'll, we'll rest on his authority. Uh, but the question that, that you should be asking, and the question that I want you to think about, is, is that relevant? 
Okay, there's a logical fallacy that, that's out there called the appeal to authority, right? And, and what that says is that, oh, well, because Jim and I are, are taking science seriously and, and, and we, you know, I, I think I'm a decent scientist, he certainly is, because we're decent scientists um, and we're also both Christians, therefore you should be Christians too. And, and so that would be the appeal to authority. And in that sense, you could say, well, maybe we are making that argument. You know, obviously we are both very, very uh, scientifically minded. And so the problem with that argument is that, you know, you can have very, very smart people and they can be very, very wrong about very important things. And similarly, you can have people who aren't so smart and they can be very, very right about very important things. Okay, so in this sense, I think it'd be easy to walk away tonight with this idea that, oh, well, they're Christians, maybe I should be a Christian too. Uh, but that's not what we want you to come away with. And in, in fact, you know, what, what, we really want to take, what we really want the take-home message, or what I want the take-home message to be, is not so much that you believe or, or you're swayed one way or the other based on our, you know, scientific prowess or the work that we're doing, but we want you to think about this, this common belief that because you're, you're a Christian, you can't therefore take science seriously. Or because you're, you're thinking about science, or because you're really, really interested in science, you know, that's somehow incompatible with Christianity. Um, you know, being a Christian doesn't mean that you can't take science seriously. And that's the message that, well, that's the first message that I think is really important. Uh, for you guys to take home, is that if you're a Christian and you're out there and somebody is saying, well, you know, you're just a fool because of your faith, you know, I, I think it would be difficult, it'd be very difficult for me to call Jim Tor a fool. You might get away with it with me, but, but certainly you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to say, I don't take science seriously. And my evolution on these ideas, my personal evolution, no pun intended, has, has changed over time. Okay? The second, the corollary to this is that because you can't base your faith on, on my authority or on Jim's authority, what we want you to do and what, what the whole purpose, I think, of this Veritas Forum is, is to get you to think about it on your own. You know, Jim and I are both Christians, but I think we would both say that it's important for you to own your own faith. And so, so don't get up here and say, oh, well, they're scientists, they, they believe, and therefore it's okay for me to believe. I think what we want you to do is, is go, ask questions, talk to Jim, talk to me, talk to other people who've really thought about it. Uh, be respectful. You might come out with different answers than we do, but, but I believe, and I think Jim would believe, is that if you investigate Christianity, I think it's pretty hard um, to find the, the uh, to come away with, with the, 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 the idea that th those claims aren't compelling or those claims don't warrant um, real consideration. Okay, and so I'm going to end my talk very similar to his, his talk. Does science make faith obsolete? Well, Jim said not for me, and I'm going to say, well, not for me either. Um, you know, I, I think in the sense that as far as I'm a scientist and I've thought about scientific issues, I don't see that there's a conflict between my faith and, and my scientific practice. But the take-home message for you guys is don't take my word for it. Don't take Jim's word for it. Go find out on your own. Have the discussions. Do the investigation. Um, and, and see what you can come up with. Okay? Thank you. Jim, you want to come back up? There's two microphones, one here and one there in the aisles, um, uh, to ask a question on your own. But I, I'll, I'll get started a little bit here to, uh, and ask one that I have from the audience. It says, um, there was one here for Dr. Tour in particular. Dr. Tour, um, <clears throat> if you're questioning the paradigm of Darwinian evolution because it does not attempt to defend any mechanisms, then uh, what do you want to replace it with and what lines of reason would you advocate to bring clarity to the question of macroevolution's mechanisms? Right, that's, that's a fair question. First of all, I'm not, I'm not trying to attack Darwinism. I'm trying to ask the question and just do what scientists do. They ask the question. 
And, and any time people get upset and you're asking the question, then it begs another question, why are you getting so upset? Uh, if it were really that clear, you explain it. So I just wanted to find that. I'm only asking the question because I really don't understand. Now, we do not have... So, so to, to ask a question and to suspect that, that uh, uh, it needs further upbuilding doesn't mean that I have to have an alternative explanation. I have no alternative explanation. This is why I'm not an advocate of intelligent design in the classroom. I think it's worth mentioning in the classroom, but it's going to be a very short lecture. <laughs> There's not many tools that you can use in science to prove intelligent design. You can use statistical arguments, but the tools that I use as a chemist, the tools that I use, which I hold my colleagues to have to use as well in their arguments in explaining evolution, it would be a very short lecture and you certainly couldn't make a course out of it. So, so I feel that if you're in a classroom, yes, you teach evolution, but you also teach that there are real problems with this in that there isn't a molecular mechanism. There's people that have, have put forth statistical arguments, put forth that time wasn't enough, it clearly wasn't enough, that there are things in the fossil record that, that, that they want to say that there's this, this punctuated evolution, things happen in very, very quick bursts, which are contrary to what this slow development and, and, and slow things, that you put all of that out there and let people then decide for themselves once they see this data. But I don't have an alternative, and to require somebody to have an alternative before you can question the first thing is wrong science. You can question what's out there without having an alternative. Okay. Um, here's one. Says, would you comment on this, please, either one of you? It says, um, it says, I would say evolution is a real demonstrable process. Uh, it is a subset of nature, however. Um, it's a process of nature, just like, uh, it says, just like uh, plate tectonics, for example. Nature is larger than the process of evolution, and God is the God of nature. Care to comment on that? <laughs> That's maybe I, philosophical, huh? I don't yeah, know. Very, uh, you're asking a physicist to make a philosophical statement. Maybe that's a mistake. Um, yeah, I think to a certain extent I would, I would agree with that. But yeah, I think the, the question that, that people have is not so much that evolution is a demonstrable process. Um, you know, clearly it is. We all know that there's antibiotic-resistant bacteria, and I just had an antibiotic-resistant bacteria infection a few weeks ago. Um, and so, you know, it's nothing like being told, oh, your Cipro is not working. But, so, so there's evolution on the real scale. The question I think that, that the skeptic or the, you know, maybe Jim or, or somebody who's more um, skeptical of evolution would ask is, can those microscopic uh, changes turn into large-scale speciation events? And again, I have no idea how it works. I, I can't explain punctuated equilibrium. Um, but... Like I said during, during my aspect of the talk, I think you know, if, if God is over it, then, then certainly God is able to do what he wants. And the small amounts of change that we do see um, are enough that I can, I can have a passing acceptance of, of evolutionary theory, even if I don't necessarily understand how all of those big things, I mean, you imagine the 30,000 genes in the human body all evolving at separate rates. I mean, that plot I put up there, you know, that's for three proteins, but you have all sorts of genes, you have all sorts of other things going on, epigenetic effects and, and you know, non-protein effects going on too. There's lots of complexity, and to be honest, even if we could have a really good theory of everything, I'm not sure that any one person would be able to fully understand it. Um, and so, you know, I think Personally, I would say it's, it's fine to be able to question evolution. I would have no problem with somebody, you know, wondering about the, the time scales or the, the changes in molecular clock rates that are sometimes seen. Um, and I think that's why it's important to study it. But I am very comfortable with people saying, you know, God is over all of it and, and he can do what he wants. 
I'm not sure if that answered the question. Yeah, I, I, I believe it said that, that evolution is, is, it can be demonstrated. Well, I, I, it says evolution is a real demonstrable process okay, in so, nature, but it's a subset of nature. Okay, it's a demonstrable process in nature. I am not sure that I can agree with that in that somebody has to now put nature in some confine in which we say here nature has indeed demonstrated this in anything of a complex system and I'm not sure that that's ever happened. Clearly we are here, clearly we work, but that is not demonstrated that evolution thereby must have occurred. Okay. All right. um, here's another one. Uh, by the way, anybody in the audience that would like to come to, a, to the microphone and make a question? Yeah, go ahead. Before I read one off a card again, is there someone? Raise the hand there. Yeah. If, if you'd like to, come on up and come to the microphone, if you will. <clears throat> and if you will, be brief and ask a question. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I'm Richard Fairchild. I'm the president hey, of Richard, the SA. Yeah. Uh, pleased to be here. I'm an uh, openly atheist, and we discuss these questions at our group meeting. Uh, does science make faith obsolete? And we kind of came to the conclusion that no, it doesn't. But uh, um, the question that I have is do you think evolutionary biology is just kind of in its infancy, like, uh, say, if you were to ask Isaac Newton about differential equations at the age of 19, he wouldn't know, but by 23, he had discovered it. So do you think your, your question is a good question, but do you think it, it, it'll just simply be a matter of time before we have the answer? I, I think that that may well be. Where we are right now, there's so much that's left open, but it might be in 100 years, it's going to be a very different, it's going to be much better defined, or in two or 300 years, it might be much better defined. And I'm fine with that. And that's, that's really the nature of science. But the way it's structured now, you're not even allowed to ask the question. You have to accept this as a given. Because if you start asking the question, people start resisting you, and this is a real thing. Think about this. You're a young man here. Think about this. That your career will be influenced by asking the question. Now, I don't know if you're a philosophy major or what your major is. Uh, political science. Okay. So in my world, I tell my young colleagues, you might not want to express this very openly, that you feel this way, because people will take shots at you. At you. If they've done this to me, in my position, imagine what they'll do to the young. So what happens is they're restricting us from doing the very thing you want to do, to being able to come to the answers here because we have to now embrace this. I've been given textbooks for high school students, and they're utterly clueless. They, they say that, that the, uh, so, so the oligonucleotides, this is the pieces of making up DNA, actually came together in the air. Now, do you know the concentration of oligonucleotides you would need to come together in the air? And they don't just come together. You need enzymes to put them together. It is utter nonsense. So we can sit here very philosophically and say, yes, in a few hundred years. But it's not going to happen if we can't first ask the question. But yeah, it just may be we're, we're here a few hundred years too early. We're going to have these answers, but it won't come if we can't ask the question. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, you've talked about evolution a lot tonight, um, and one thing I've been curious about is young earth creationism. Um, I know, Nick, you, you brought it up. Um, so my question to both of you is, are, are you a young earth creationist, and if so, uh, how do you explain that scientifically? And if not, how do you explain that scripturally? How do you come to terms with that in, in light of uh, the biblical scripture? For, for the, if you will, for the sake of everybody, just define what young earth creationist is, okay. and then go on. Um, so, I, so young earth creationism, in, in my assessment, would be uh, uh, creation of the universe within a seven literal day uh, time span, or I guess six literal six. day time span. Uh, the seventh day is ongoing. Um, and 
you know, essentially a miraculous creation out of, out of nothing. Um, and so I think probably it's clear to everybody that I'm not a, a young earth creationist. Um, how I would square that with scripture, I think uh, lots of people have done this, but, and so this might be sort of parroting the, the same old stuff if you already heard it before. Um, but generally it's my impression, now I'm no Hebrew scholar, uh, but the, uh, it's my impression that the, the days uh, discussed in Genesis uh, you know, can be uh, interpreted as the day of the Lord, so longer than simply a 24-hour day. Uh, similarly, the, the, uh, you know, the sun wasn't created until the fourth day. So thinking about a literal 24-hour day, you know, a revolution about the sun, um, you know, it's, it's not, we're not, not about the sun, I guess, revolving around the Earth's axis in the context of the sun. Um, you know, that doesn't seem to make sense if, if the sun's not even around. Um, and so, again, I don't, I'm, not sure, I, I'm not sure about all the theological implications, but, but a, one view of those six days is that you create sort of containers on the first three and... I, then you fill the containers on the second three. And, you know, some people like that, some people really don't, uh, but I guess I would probably have to lean towards that interpretation where that, those first six days are so, sort of a, a Hebrew poetic uh, description of how creation is occurring. Every bit true, and I would say that the Bible is true in that regard, it's just that, you know, it's true in that a, a poem is true, rather than it's true that this is precisely what happened on day one, you know, these enzymes were formed, and on day two, these enzymes. So, so that's sort of how I would describe it. Now, I'll, I'll turn over the floor to somebody more, more learned. No, I'm, I'm not more learned. I'll just give you my opinion on this. Let, let, let me just say, that this varies where you live. My son-in-law is, is studies Bible at Hebrew University. He's a Messianic Jew born in, in Israel, lived his whole life in Jerusalem. When I told him that this is an issue uh, uh, from the Genesis account, he, he scratched his head. He could not fathom that this is important in people's world and figuring this thing out because to him this is beautiful poetry where God is revealing something through poetry. He says, you, you just totally missed it. Uh, but he has other problems <laughs> that, that we, don't, we don't deal with. But, it, this is unique to our, our particular culture. Not to all cultures has it, has it been unique to, but let me just say this, that I am sympathetic to both sides. Certainly the earth looks like it's been around much longer than 10,000 years, or, or eight to 10,000 years. We have light that's coming to us from planets that took, would take much longer. We know the distance that these stars are away from us, and we know how long it would take the light to reach us, and the light's already here. We have, we have dating that, that uh, may change, but I'm sympathetic to both arguments. But one of the most intriguing that I've heard is, is that of, of Gerald Schroeder. And he's, he's a Jew. He's, he, he's, he's not a Messianic Jew. He's just a regular Jew. He lives in Jerusalem, but he's a physicist. And what he does is something very interesting. He takes the fact that we have an expanding universe, and that everyone's going to agree with we have an expanding universe so, so it's, it's, as it expands the length of a day varies so today is longer the, the today is longer than the number of hours there were yesterday when you look at it finally so in other words tomorrow will be a slightly longer day than today because we're getting out further and further in this expansion of the universe and if you look at the first literal six days of creation, what would look like a short period to us, what would be a short period would look very different depending on where you are because time is relative. Time changes on the expansion of the universe. It's a very interesting concept. If you just Google Gerald Schroeder, doesn't matter how you spell it, Google will find it, uh, <laughs> age, age of the Universe. And it's like a three or four page document. It's really amazing. It's one of the first, it would be the first to come up. Now he has a book on this as well, which is really intriguing, which w will cause you to walk away from this. And I've shared this with my young earth creationist friends, and they walk away. I say, we're all right. Everybody's right. The old earth, the young earth, it's all right. 
It just depends on the relativity of time. And, and uh, uh, so, so read this document. It's really amazing. The other thing is, if you look at human beings, human beings, even as we know them, where we have culture, where we have music, where we bury our dead, this is sub 100,000 years old. Certain, many projections are sub 50,000 years old. When we're talking about non-young Earth people, humans as we know them, not bipedal creatures where they're, but humans as we know them are sub 50,000 years old. That's very close to 10,000 years when you're talking about ge geological time frames. This is the same. The error bars are all the same. So humans as we know them are very short. And I'm not sure that I, I answered your question, but I'm sympathetic to both views. But the relativity of time here and expansion of the universe could actually make everybody live together quite happily. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, let's go to the next one, if I may. Um, if you will, please state your name and, and uh, if you're a student, that you're a student or a faculty member, that you're faculty, and ask your question briefly. Thank you. Greetings. Yeah, my name is uh, Dr. William Kaufeltz, and I actually teach a course in science and religion, so uh, this has been a really um, magical experience hearing you both talk. Um, I wanted to ask you a question dealing mostly with faith versus belief, and uh, I'm going to ask this to both of you, and perhaps I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, but couldn't you just entertain the Genesis story as being um, what they call a cosmogony? In other words, it goes beyond science. It's really giving us a spiritual and moral story of the, I guess, how you know, we find ultimate meaning. And uh, ultimate meaning goes beyond empirical meaning. So um, you can't even read the Bible Literally, I mean, the Bible is full of metaphor. Your breasts are a fawn, your hips are bushels of wheat. I mean, how can you interpret that literally? But my question is, how do you think you can emphasize that what St. Augustine said, that if, you, if a, script, a truth in Scripture contradicts a natural fact, you must interpret the, scruth, the truth of Scripture in a moral, in an allegorical, in a theological and in an anagogical way. In other words, Scripture is, is much deeper and much truer than the empirical truths of science. And to try to, you know, cash it out in terms of science versus religion is just a non-starter. Thank you. I'm going to let right. you start that one off, because that's, that's hard. Well, I, I, I think in many ways, I, I agree with you. This is what my son-in-law was getting at. He, he says, look at the way you're looking at Genesis chapter 1. To him, there's, there's an allegory, there's poetry here, that God is teaching us something, so, so, something a, a, a lot less phys physical and more metaphysical in this. On the other side of it, God being who he is and as great as he is, could well have been dropping in absolute definable seeds of truth and doing both things. And what's so beautiful about the way God is, he's created us so differently. And what gets my son-in-law excited gets me less excited. What gets me really excited doesn't excite him at all. And God's got a broad tent. And there are different people that, that can enjoy different portions of this. And God speaks to us in different ways so that I could read something in Scripture and begin to think of this in some physical context and say, Lord, you are magnificent. How beautiful this is. And you would read the same scripture and see something in an allegorical context and say, Lord, you're magnificent. How beautiful you are. And it would not be unlike God to be that big. Yeah, what, what right. he said. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I mean, I think, I think in some sense what you're saying is what's happening, uh, at least in some circles, with Genesis 1. Um, you have this sort of mystery where, where Genesis talks about, you know, the first chapter of Genesis talks about all these you know, spectacular creations and, and you know, how the world was made, and it is sort of like this, this grand poem. Uh, and then it's sort of Genesis 2, it starts all over again, and it talks about some, you know, it basically starts with Adam and Eve all over again after you've already introduced them. Um, you know, for me, and, and again, I think I see them both. Uh, I see 
you know, the aspects of the, the grand poem, but, but also the, 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 the nuggets of truth. Um, I don't understand how it works, and, and being a, a more evolutionary-minded person, I'm, I just throw up my hands. I say, I don't know. It's one of those areas where I think that, that ultimately we'll see the Scripture and, and the science be, you know, they're both going to be okay. Um, but, but I do tend, you know, I'm, I'm, I'd be a bad Presbyterian if I didn't hold to some kind of, of important view of, you know, the fall and, and the significance of that event. Um, and so I'm, I tend to lean towards a literal Adam and Eve, even if I don't necessarily understand how that works uh, from an evolutionary perspective. Let's go to this side, uh, if you will. Yes, you in the red check. All right. If you will, state your name, please. And, I was actually uh, trying to think student? how to phrase it the best. Okay, my name is Donovan Cooper. I'm going to try not to talk too fast. And um, I was just thinking, like, why, why automatically jump, or if you can't, I, I think it's good that we should ask questions as well. Like, we should always criticize ideas. And um, I was thinking, like, why automatically jump to the conclusion that it was the Christian God? Like, why not put your belief without evidence towards, I don't know, Vishnu or John Frum of the Pacific Cargo Cults? Like, why automatically say it's the Christian God? <laughs> or why have faith at all? Well, I think when I've been faced with that question, you know, I, I wasn't necessarily, so I didn't talk at all about my, my, uh, my conversion and, and, and how I came to Christ. But I started out actually as, as sort of a, a devotee of Ayn Rand. And in high school, I had spent a lot of time uh, conversing over email with uh, a guy named Harry Binswanger, who was one of, I think, Ayn Rand's close cohorts. And he, he uh, I mean, he had a lot of good things to say, uh, and I would still probably would be more of towards a libertarian political view. But, you know, when I was coming to Christ and when I was investigating, you know, I think that was a very valid question. Why one versus the other? And I think as I asked around and as I talked to different people uh, about what they believed, um, you know, I found that the, the Christian uh, story was, was the most compelling. And so, and for me, that, again, that sort of gets back into the Adam and Eve. You know, for me, the, the you know, why do I feel like I have shame? What, what is sin? How do I deal with that? Um, you know, if you ask me why I believe the Christian faith, it's because I feel like the Christian faith has the most um, compelling answer for those questions about, you know, what is sin and, and how, how should we deal with sin? And I don't think, you know, this is personally, I don't think the other faiths are, are as uh, compelling, or I haven't found them as compelling. But certainly getting on, on, you know, the last point of my talk, you know, I think it would be, you know, my encouragement is to investigate those and see which ones you would find com most compelling. Um, you know, personally, I, I was convinced by the Christian uh, dialogue, but... You know, I think that that's something that everybody has to make up for their own, own their, make up their own minds. So uh, I, I wasn't emailing anyone in high school because email didn't exist when I was in high school. <laughs> um, but I told you my story, and I would love to be able to say, oh, I invested all the faith, investigated all the faiths, and then I can. Something happened to me when I started reading verses from the Bible and Jesus said, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. Now, if you take a person who is addicted to pornography, and I was, and you say, how could I be addicted to pornography? There was 18, there was no internet yet. I worked in a gas station by New York City on the highway and the businessman, the, the would throw away their magazines on the way home on Friday nights. And I started getting this stash of magazines from the time I was 14. By the time I was 18, I was heavily addicted. To anybody who has been addicted to pornography or had other addictions, what happens to them, I was delivered from that at that instant, at that instant, when Jesus visited me in my room on November 7, 1977. That verse convicted me, and something happened to me. Since then, 
I've had many Indian friends, I've had many Muslim friends. I've not been as convinced. And though we coexist beautifully as friends, you can't have it all. In Christianity, God has a son, his name is Jesus Christ. In Islam, God has no son, he does not beget. The two cannot coexist. You cannot hold both truths. You can, I have Muslim friends, I love them as people, but I can't hold both truths and be honest to both texts. They can't both be right. So for me, faith in God. I have other friends that, that are scientists, that are Hindus. I have actually some of my best conversations with people when I go to the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia. You talk to professors there, and we are just so excited about God, the God of Abraham, and we're both scientists. And so, so in this culture, it's more excluded than in other cultures. To have Indians who are scientists and also devout Hindus generally is not a problem. It's more a problem in this culture and in European culture, and that's why I think we're addressing it. But that God should come to people. How could so great a God come and display his love for people? We would be terrified. He is so magnificent. So what he does is he comes in the form of a baby. What happens when a baby is brought in the room? Everybody's, oh, oh. Everybody loves a baby. Nobody's intimidated by a baby. You can have a very big man. Doesn't intimidate his wife because she's grown up around him. Doesn't intimidate his parents. God came in the form of a baby and then grew up in our midst. And he says, this is so that I could relate to you. The story is so utterly compelling that God would reach out to men in this way and say, I don't squash you. I come, I want your love, because without love, with, with, without free will, love itself would be impossible. I don't want to just corral you and to say, you have to love me. How do you commit? The Bible says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength. The one thing that is so difficult, how do you command somebody to love? You can command me to obey you, command me to bring you food, but you can't make me love you. And God commands us this because he's demonstrated his love to us in the person of Jesus Christ. This, to me, is a very compelling story. And for me to sit here and say, well, I really, I don't know much about Hinduism or much about Islam. I know a lot about those, but that's not how I came into this. How I came into this was that Jesus Christ visited me on November 7th, 1977, delivered me from an addiction, filled me with peace, and I couldn't get a smile off my face. That's what happened to me. That's my faith. And now I've been exposed to many other faiths. But this is it for me. But I'm not saying you have to take this route, nor did I ever say you have to take this route. Okay? Right. Um, thank you. And, um, but if all these faiths, like, don't, like, if they clash so badly, why not just get rid of the faith? Like, why not just get rid of all faith, all faiths, like all different beliefs without evidence? If what then there would be no so problems badly, I'm with... sorry, I missed your question. If what clashes? You said that you liked Jesus Christ because in Islam there is no God, so they don't go together. That's not true at all. In Islam, there is very definitely a God. Oh, not God. I mean, like, there's no son. He doesn't have a son. I'm saying, like, if all the different faiths of the world clash so badly, like, if they don't, get rid if of they them? contradict each other so badly, why not get rid of all the faith? Because I think that that would, be, that would be, first of all, it would never happen. Second of all, this is so precious to people. This is like life itself. Why not just get rid of all food because people have different cuisines? Because we actually need food. <laughs> yeah, we okay. actually need faith. I mean, you look at societies uh, without faith. You look at what Stalin like has done. Or... Stalin killed 50 million of his own people. Stalin you think, you think that religion <laughs> is mean. We, religion, religion can't hold a candle in dastardliness to what communism has done, what lack of faith has done. You look, look at Mao, look at Pol Pot, look at Stalin. I mean, these things are really, really wicked without God. Okay, but um, what about Scandinavia right now in Japan? They are one of the most faithless places in the world, and they have way lower crimes than, like, 
way lower crime rates than we do here? I, I don't have an answer for that. I'm okay. sorry, I'm not a philosopher. Right, you just said, like, we have some others that want to ask questions. Let me come over okay, to this guy you. right here. <clears throat> My name's uh, Chris Dees. I am a mechanical engineering student. Uh, I love philosophy. I've been told that I'm a fairly outspoken atheist, but I'm also really cheerful at the same time. You're so maybe really what? Out. I've been told that I'm a fairly outspoken atheist, but that I'm also very cheerful at the same time. So maybe that can help out. Um, my question is to you, Dr. Tour, and it has to do, <coughs> excuse me, it has to do with uh, your slide that had the list of scientists on it that were skeptical of evolution. And basically it's, do you think that you were confronted, because I remember you said you got some feedback from it, do uh, you think that you were confronted because you were skeptical and seeking a more thorough understanding of evolution, or could the confrontation be motivated by the fact that the list was put together by the Controversial Discovery Institute, which is pro-creationism and anti-evolution? Right. Yeah, this, this is a very fair question. I, I sat with two chemists together once, uh, one was in the national, both were in the National Academy, one was a Nobel Prize winner. And, and uh, um, I asked them, what is it about the statement that really bothered them? Because they said, you signed that statement, so we're not going to put your name forward for, for such and such honor. I said, you know, I've done twice as much as the other people who have gotten that honor. They said, there is no question you've done twice as much. You've done more than twice as much. But because you signed that statement, I said, could you tell me what it is about that statement that you don't like? They didn't even know what the statement was. Right? I'm just I said, okay, how about you guys go back and read the statement and we'll get together again? That's how silly it has become. And they said, well, people, they said, people, you, they, they went back, they read it. They said, well, yes, it was carefully crafted. Well, duh, you're going you're gonna to ask people to sign something that's not carefully crafted? You, you ask people to sign something that just says we are skeptical and it warrants further investigation, which is exactly where science is. And they said, no, what bothers us is people use that statement to, to teach evolution in schools, to teach creationism in schools. I said, well, you know, what people use that statement for, I can't control. That's up to them what they want to use it for. People use cars to rob banks. Do we get rid of cars? I mean, there, people use things for different things, but that was their rationale, which I thought was really unfair. So you're asking me why they've done this. You need to ask them why they, they did this, but this is the explanation that they gave me. And I looked both of them right in the eye. I said, can you explain to me? You're both chemists. Can you explain to me macroevolution? And you know what they said? Nothing. And nothing is an answer in itself. And the reason they didn't say no is because there were two of them there. If I were with either one of them, they would say no. But they couldn't say to me yes. You ask them that question. And I'm not sure that it's as antithetical as you think that an atheist can't be happy. I have no atheists and they, they, they've, they've been happy. So you're not the only atheist. Oh, I'm aware. Actually, okay. uh, Richard Fairchild, who spoke earlier, the president of the Secular Student Alliance here, actually was the one that got that group going back in 2008. I'm, I, there are plenty of happy atheists on campus. Okay. So I agree. Aware. I've got uh, 8.59. We said we'd be done at 9 o'clock. Can you all make a quick question before we end up? All right, um, so my name is Ahmed Raspberry. I'm actually a graduate student in the biology department. And so I just have a real quick question for both of you. Um, you both are professional chemists, um, and you both talked about good science and um, basically the good things that scientists practice. Do you not feel that it's a little bit um, unethical for two chemists to walk up on a stage and talk to a general population of people about a science that you both have already claimed multiple times that you don't really understand. <laughs> well, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I think I think there's a there's differences in levels of understanding, right? So, I've I said numerous times on this stage that I'm not quite sure 
how the time scales work of evolution. Um, but I would be willing to go to bat probably with anybody in this room about what causes protein structure to be protein structure and what are the physical forces that are involved in making a protein fold uh, up from a random piece of spaghetti into a um, you know, functional uh, globular form. And so in that sense, you know, I feel like I have a very good understanding about what the relevant molecules in biology and biochemistry are. Okay, and so the question here is whether I fully understand something versus whether I uh, understand enough of it that I can, you know, raise the, the relevant questions. And I think that's part of what scientific training is. You know, no field, I mean, if science could fully understand or fully explain, you know, nanoscience, if science could fully under, under, understand or explain meteorology, there wouldn't be a need for that field to be a science anymore. Okay, so the fact that I'm in a biophysical chemistry environment means that there's still questions that are out there that I don't know the answers to. And that doesn't mean I just throw up my hands and say, well, I'm not a scientist. It means that I, I have enough of an experience under my belt that I can say, okay, this is what we understand, this is where we don't understand things, and these are the questions that can help us get from point A to point B. And so just because I don't understand everything you know, along the way from point A to point B doesn't mean that I don't have the authority or the um, training to recognize, okay, these are, the, these are the issues that we really don't have the best understanding about. Uh, and so in that sense, I think the premise of your questions is a little off base. But that said, you know, I think that's, that's part of the training, that's part of the learning process is, is, you know, that's why we spend so much time in graduate school and whatnot is to go and be able to say, okay, this is the scientific problem and this is how we pick it apart into its relevant points. And, and I'd be the first to recognize that, you know, as a physical chemist, yes, it's helpful for me to have bioinformaticists and, and you know, evolutionary biologists and people who are out in the field studying actual species. We all have to come together on this. Uh, but as a, as a biophysicist who understands a lot about proteins, you know, that's, that's where my assessment is. I, I think that you, 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 where are you? Because I don't know where you moved to. So. Okay, I, I, I think you underscored the, the precise point here with that question. And that's this. We did not intend, the organizers did not intend to have Jim Tour here giving a point and having Nick here giving pro point. It was to have counterpoint. Nobody would come forward to go counterpoint with me. So you think that maybe your biology professor understands. He or she could have come. They don't understand. In your mind, they understand. They don't understand this. They cannot come here and on a molecular level say, look, here it is. There was nobody here who understands. In the, it, the, you exactly have hit this, the nail on the head. I said, get me a chemist, get me a biologist who will go counterpoint with me. I didn't want to deal with philosophy because I'm not a philosopher, although several people wanted to engage me in philosophy, I did the best I could. I said, but get me a chemist, get me a philosopher, uh, get, get me a, a biologist, get me a biochemist, someone on the campus. Nobody would come forward. You've underscored it. Last question. <clears throat> All right, I'm, I'm, I, at first I will apologize for this question. Um, as you've repeatedly stated, you're not a philosopher and you don't really want to be engaged in philosophy. But this is something of a philosophical question. Do you believe that as a Christian, it is your sacred duty as a Christian to bring the word of God to everyone? Can, can, I, can I say something other than just yes or no? Yes. Okay. So, it is my sacred duty as a Christian to obey the scriptures. And I do have a duty to communicate the gospel. That communication can sometimes be as open and blatant as it has been tonight, but that communication can come forth in the way that I lead my life. So when, it, when there is a differential of power, when a student is in my classroom, I do not come forth like I've come forth tonight because there's a differential of power there 
where I have power over their grades. To my students in my laboratory, I don't come on in this way. When they are leaving my research group, when they're, after they've gotten their PhD, before I send them away, I say, do you mind if I pray for you? At that point, they've already gotten their degree, and I pray for them. I do put a scripture verse on the top of each exam. I've done this since I was an assistant professor, the first exam I ever gave. And students I've found write scripture verses back to me. The most common one is, blessed are the merciful. <laughs> and, but I figure if my colleagues can put John Lennon at the top of an exam, I could put Jesus Christ at the top of an exam. But that's because we live in a university that, that's quite open. But I'm very careful about differential of power so that I do not push this upon people because God never forces himself upon us. That's good. Um, that's, that's what I wanted to hear. Um, the follow-up to that question is, you have arenas like this where that differential doesn't exist anymore, where you can speak openly and freely. And my question is, and you don't, you don't have to answer this, but you've said before that you, as a scientist, you think it is enough to merely ask the question. I would say that as a Christian, it would be your duty to use the knowledge that you have through science to find an alternative instead of merely asking the question in order to bring your faith and bring the peace of your faith to other people. If you want to say anything to that, you can. Yeah. But so, that is my personal belief. Right, I understand, but so that would be like asking me to solve a series of nonlinear differential equations. It is your duty to solve this. I find it unsolvable, this massive array of, 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 of uh, nonlinear differential equations. You can say it is your duty to find an answer. Uh, I wish I had an answer. I can, I can say God created this and be happy with that as a Christian and as a person of faith. I cannot bring that into the classroom as a satisfying explanation. I have a duty to use the tools of science. So using the tools of science that I have available to me in 2015, I cannot come up with an explanation. That's not to say that I don't stop thinking about it. Maybe I will find it. But maybe we don't have the tools to have the answers yet. So we do the best we can. But thank you. All right, well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org. If you like the content that's coming out on this channel, I've not monetized it in the sense of advertising, but if you want to give and you want to help support it, you can give to a 501c3 so it's fully tax deductible and you can see the link below. We'd love to have your participation and there's several mechanisms by which you could give. Thank you.